So I saw you meditating in Sariputta's cave view as we walked up. One bought his feet. Was it peaceful? Yes. Sariputta's cave. Mokalana cave was it peaceful. How was Velavana? Bought his peak in the morning. Velavana in the afternoon. Bought his peak again in the evening. Most of what I will read, we've already brushed over it, but it's just nice to now that we've been to those places repeatedly, recollect what occurred there. I was thinking, you know, what happened here in Magadha, in this city of Rajagaha, was really awesome. And we overuse that word, we use it in contexts that aren't really awesome, but what happened here really was awesome. It was epic. Uh, when you read it, it's, it's like bigger than Ben-Hur. It's like, when the Buddha was enlightened and after he taught those thousand fire worshipping ascetics, they walked from Gaya to here. So the Buddha walked here with a thousand arahants. He walked into, like even in Thailand there are still arahants, but there's not that many. And if you see one on one occasion, it's a really big, it's a big deal. For me, for most of us, can you imagine a thousand with the Buddha as their head? Now, when King Bimbisara heard that the Raja Gaha means the, the dwelling place or the seat of the Raja, Raja Gaha, so the Raja was King Bimbisara. When King Bimbisara heard that the Buddha had become enlightened and was coming here with his following, 120,000 Magadans went to pay respects. It's just, it's epic. If you made a movie about it, you'd look at it and think, no, no, it's too much. But it really happened. What's interesting is when the Bodhisattva went forth as the prince from where he was, uh, where he was uh, Kapilavastu, the, the royal kingdom, he came to Rajagaha and the King Bimisara met him as a Bodhisattva and I'll read a little bit about that as well. But it, it makes me think that Rajagya must have been famous as a spiritual, I don't know what you'd call it, it's just uh, a lot of very sincere spiritual practice because remember the Buddha We've just come from Gaia, 80 kilometers. There was three Kasapa brothers. One had 500 fire-worshipping method heresetic disciples. Another had 300, another had 200. So you've just got this like huge numbers of summoners. 200 here, 300 there, 500 there. Venerable Sariputra and Moggallana were studying with another teacher who had 250, not too far away. So Rajagi, I, I have the sense, Rajagi must have been famous as a land of uh, spiritual pursuit. And King Bimbisara obviously had a lot of barami and must have been very supportive of that. And it's interesting that after the Buddha had his first disciples, became Arahants down there in near Varanasi, he didn't try to set up his monastery or a headquarters in next to Varanasi. Varanasi is like the ancient uh, home of Vedic culture. So he kind of basically did a big detour and he came to Rajya because King Bimbisara was, had invited him as a, when he'd just gone forth to come back and teach him. So obviously King Bimbisara had a close kind of connection with the Buddha from past life and everything was in place basically that his kingdom was ready to receive a thousand arahats. Amazing. And that 120,000 people were ready to pay respects to those arahats on the first day that they arrived. It's, it's awesome. Other things which are awesome is, uh, you know, when you read this story it's totally samsara. The Buddha is living in samsara. There's a certain number of right conditions, and so a lot of people can get enlightened. But even the Buddha, and I love this as a contemplation, even the Buddha has an enemy. After cultivating Bharami for four asankhyas, which is just this incredibly long period of time, at plus 100,000 eons, you would have thought that you'd make enough merit and dedicated enough merit and spread enough loving kindness to everyone. But no, there's this one guy that's, uh, and this is the thing that he sometimes called the Buddha's evil cousin. Anyway, in Buddhism, we don't believe that any, anyone is purely evil, entirely evil, and this is important. What we believe is that evil qualities affect people's minds for periods of time. But no one is at heart evil. So Devadatta, unfortunately, the Buddha's cousin, was affected by qualities such as jealousy and competition, and very badly affected. 
and he caused a couple of uh, serious, you know, upsets in the Buddha's life, which the Buddha, being the Buddha, wasn't upset about. <laughs> but he did make problems. And it's just an interesting thing. It's really important to understand that samsara is samsara. You can't get it perfect. Even a Buddha can't make samsara perfect. But with all of his perfected perfections, the Buddha is perfect. But he still has this cousin that developed a grudge and a lot of resentment eons ago who wants to run the community. He wants to be the boss. He wants to be as famous. He wants the offerings. And so, just as you've got the Buddha here with a thousand arahants, you've got Devadatta up on Vulture's Peak, hiding behind a rock, waiting for the Buddha to walk past and pushing the rock down on him. It didn't hit him. It's impossible to kill a Buddha. And it's one of, one of the results of cultivating all of that merit is that nobody can kill you. But it did cut his foot. His foot did get cut and it did draw blood. And that was one of the things that led Devadatta to the lowest and most painful hell, which is where he is now. So after he did successfully split the community for a period of time, uh, not long after that, apparently the earth opened up and he fell to a bit hell. Now this is what I was saying though about no absolute unchanging evil condition. He did build a lot of barami alongside the Bodhisattva for thousands of lives. So that's why he was able to become a bhikkhu, he had the jhanas, he had psychic powers, but then he got obsessed by this desire for gain and desire for fame, and he went off. But he will, apparently, he will never meet an arahant or a Buddha again because he made such bad karma. But he will become a Pacheka Buddha. And that's just, for myself I like these contemplations. The, for example, that Mahamogalana was once Ma, a few lives back, before being Mahamogalana. That's really interesting, you know, just for your samsaric perspective. And the fact that Devadatta will, in a few lives, after he spends a long time in Aviji Hell, experiencing the results of the bad karma, he will be a Pacheka Buddha. And that his mind will be so pure and so aloof from Kinesa and anybody, anybody that makes offerings to him or pays respects to him will be accumulating enormous amounts of merit. It's just wonderful for me. I really love contemplating that. It's like, at the same time, we have to be really careful about karma. It's very real. So whatever tendency we have to be jealous, whatever tendency we have to be competitive, be really careful with that. Don't feed it because, you know, we're all virtuous people, we have strong connection with Buddhism, we wouldn't be here otherwise, and our connection is getting stronger. We already had a certain amount of merit, and now we're making more merit. But if you end up being a person who has barami, more and more barami, barami is energy, and you need to know how to use it. And so if you're not really, really diligent, like now, today, this lifetime, trying to weaken your negative qualities, you could become a person with barami that does a lot of damage, and has to spend a lot of time in a long time in hell <laughs> before becoming a Pacheka Buddha. <coughs> so it's like, you have to be careful basically. But I'll just read that, just kind of giving a bit of perspective, it's just amazing, isn't it? The Velavana with 1,250 Arahants, the Buddha teaching the Awada Padinoka, up there on Vulture's Peak, teaching the most subtle Dhammas to the most developed Bodhisattvas. And then on the other hand, you've got Devadatta trying to push a rock on him getting the royal elephant drunk and releasing the elephant to chase after the Buddha. Just, you know, the stuff of samsara. <laughs> All good stuff. I don't know how long he came in or just come here. He came and went, so it was more like a retreat place for him. So I think he, I, I'm not sure exactly how long he spent, but there's many places. There was the, the mango grove that the, the doctor gave, Shivaka gave to him and there were other places that he stayed in this area yeah for coming and going and then later he moved more to Jetavana and Savati but I think the first six seven eight years was mostly in this area and uh, and he came back also between Magadha what was the other kingdom Kosala where King Prasenadi was the king and uh, Magadha and, and uh, Kosala Since we're in Rajgir, the seat of the Raja, I'm just going to read a little bit about that. It's the, the first meeting of King Bimbisara with the Bodhisattva. It's, it's written in verse. And it's the Buddha talking about that occasion. Now I will tell the going forth, 
Now he, the mighty seer, went forth. Now he was questioned and described the reason for his going forth. The crowded life lived in a house exhales an atmosphere of dust, but life gone forth is open wide. He saw this and he chose the going forth. By his so doing, he refused all evil action of the body, rejected all wrong kinds of speech, and rectified his livelihood besides. He went to Rajikaha town, the castle of the Magadans. There he, the Bodhisattva, went for arms. With many a mark of excellence, King Bimbisara from within his palace saw him passing by. And when he saw the excellence of all the marks, Look, sirs, he said, how handsome is that man, how stately. How pure and perfect is his conduct, with downcast eyes and mindful, looking only a plough yoke's length before him, he is no lowly lineage. Send the royal messengers at once to follow up the path the bhikkhu takes. The messengers were sent at once and followed closely in his wake. Now which way will the bhikkhu go? Where has he chosen his abode? He wanders on from house to house, guarding sense doors with real restraint fully aware and mindfully, he soon has filled his begging bowl. His arms round is now done. The sage is setting out and leaves the town, taking the road to Pandava. He must live on the hill of Pandava. Now when he came to his abode, the messengers went up to him, though one of them turned back again to give the king the answer to his question. The bhikkhu sire, like a tiger, or like a bull, or like a lion, is seated in a mountain cave upon the eastern slope of Pandava. The warrior heard the runner's tale, then summoning a coach of state. He drove in haste out of the town, out to the hill of Pandava. He drove as far as he could go and then descended from the coach. The little distance that remained, he went on foot till he drew near the sage. The king sat down and he exchanged greetings and asked about his health. When his exchange of courtesy was done, the king then spoke to him these words. You are quite young, a youth, a boy in the first phase of life. You have the good looks of a man of high-born warrior, noble stock, one fit to grace a first-rate army, to lead the troops of elephants. I offer you a fortune, take it. Your birth, I ask you also, tell it. There is a prosperous country, sire, and vigorous, right up against the foothills of Himalaya, inhabited by Kozalans, whose race is named after the sun, whose lineage is Sakyan, but I have not gone forth to seek sense pleasures. I have gone out to strive, seeing danger in them, and seeing safe refuge from them in renouncing. That is my heart's desire. So apparently, King Bimbisara then offered him his kingdom. He was offering him a military post, and he said, okay, we'll take my kingdom. And uh, the Bodhisattva replied, no, I'm seeking the deathless. I don't want a kingdom. Lumbini and Kapilavatu are quite some way away and when the Buddha went forth, the Bodhisattva went forth, he came to Rajkia. We're in a special place. We talk about civilizations and we talk about the cradles of civilizations, but I see this area of Magadha in terms of civilizing the mind, isn't it? This was a place of civilizing the mind. This is a place of spiritual evolution. And King Bimbisara obviously stewarded that. He, he must have been a patron to a number of, of uh, spiritual seekers. So that when the Buddha returns with the thousand arahants, everything's in place. The royal kingdom and the, and the noble friends of the king are went ready to support. And they embrace them and they support them. So, in the next time I'm going to read, the Buddha has just taught the thousand matted hair fire ascetics and then they were liberated. The last two lines of that sutta says, and while this discourse was being delivered, the hearts of the thousand bhikkhus were delivered from tanks through non-clinging. So one thousand more arahants. Now when the Blessed One had lived at Gaya Sisa, so that's where we were the other day when we were meditating in the place where Sujata offered the milk rice and we had a look over the wall and we could see the banks of the Naranjara River. It was in this area that that sermon was taught. And when the Buddha had lived there, as long as he chose, he set out to wander by stages to Rajagaha with a large following of bhikkhus, with a thousand bhikkhus, with all the former matter ascetics, wandering by stages, he at length reached Rajagaha. 
and there he stayed in the sapling grove at the Supatita shrine. Senia bin Basara, king of Magadha, heard. It seems that the monk Gotama, the son of the Sakyans, who went forth into homelessness from a Sakyan clan, has come to Rajagaha and is living in the sapling grove of the Supatita shrine. Now the good name of Master Gotama has been spread thus. That blessed one is such since he is accomplished, fully enlightened, perfect in knowledge and conduct, sublime, the knower of the worlds, the incomparable leader of men to be tamed, the teacher of gods and men, enlightened, blessed. He makes known this world with its deities, its maras and its divinities, this generation with its monks and brahmins, with its princes and men, which he has himself realized through direct knowledge. He teaches the Dharma that is good in the beginning, good in the middle and good in the end, with the meaning and the letter. And he explains a holy life that is utterly perfect and pure. It is good to go and see such accomplished ones. So that was the Buddha's reputation already, before he's coming to town. And you can imagine that thousand ascetics have all gone forth under the Buddha, just 80 kilometers away. This would, this would make ripples. People would hear about this. Now, what this phrase, uttered by King Bimbisara, on this occasion, I don't know who said it first, but basically this is chanting in our morning, chanting every morning. We say these exact phrases. So it's just nice that when you do this chanting, it's nice to know that it has this origin, it's drawn from this. Basically, all these things that uh, King Bimbisara is saying about the Buddha before he walks into Rajika, he's accomplished, fully enlightened, Arahako, Samma Sambhutasa, okay? and uh, perfect in knowledge and conduct, Vijaya Charana Sampano, Loka Vidu, the knower of worlds, all of these phrases that we chant. It's just nice to know that that morning chanting that we do has this 2560 or so year origin, and we chant it in the same language as well, but uh, these people were probably speaking are very similar. So Bimbisara is keen to go and pay respects. He said it is good to go and see such accomplished ones. When accompanied by 12 hosts, by 120,000 of Magadha and Brahman householders, Senia Bimbisara, king of Magadha, went to the Blessed One and after paying homage to him, he sat down at one side. But of the 12 hosts of Brahman householders, some paid homage to the Blessed One, some sat down at his side, some exchanged greetings with him, and when this courteous and formal talk was finished, sat down at one side. Some pronounced their name and clan in the Blessed One's presence and then sat down at one side. Some kept silence and then sat down at one side. They wondered, does the great monk lead the holy life under Urubela Kasapa? Or does Urubela Kasapa lead the holy life under the great monk? But the Blessed One became aware in his mind of the thought in their minds and he addressed the Venerable Urubela Kasapa in stanzas. So, this is one of the Kasapa brothers, the leader of the 500 Matapan ascetics with his two brothers. So the people in Rajgir would have known of the Rubella Kasapa, he would have had his fame, and uh, they would, they're wondering now, here's the Buddha, here's the Rubella Kasapa, who is following who? What did he see, the lean teacher who dwells at Uruvela, that he left the fires? I ask of you this question, Kasapa, how did you come to leave fire worshipping? Sights and sounds and tastes and concubines are the rewards promised for sacrifice. Of worldly things I saw they are a stain. Then worship and sacrifice gave joy no more. But if your heart finds no delight in these, Kasapa, said the Blessed One, in sights and sounds, even in tastes as well, what then delights your heart here in this world? Of gods and men, Kasapa, tell me that. I saw the state of peace not of this world, where is no owning and no sensual being, no otherness, no being led by others, then worship and sacrifice gave no more joy. So this is very profound. I saw the state of peace not of this world, where there is no owning and no sensual being, no otherness, and no being led by others. Worship and sacrifice gave no more joy. Then a venerable Uruvela Kasapa rose from his seat and arranging his robe on one shoulder, he prostrated himself with his head at the Blessed One's feet, saying, Lord, the Blessed One is my guide, I am a disciple. Then the twelve hosts of Magadan Brahman householders thought Uruvela Kasapa lives a holy life under the Blessed One. The Blessed One, aware in his mind, the thought in their minds, then gave them progressive instruction. 
At length, the spotless, immaculate vision of the Dharma arose then and there in eleven of the twelve hosts of the Magadhan Brahmin householders. All that is subject to arising is subject to cessation, and one host became adherent. Okay, so leaders of large clans, eleven out of twelve, I would assume this means it just attained Sotatana. We were talking about Ajahn and Nam has said in his Dharma talks that after things were established here, it was about 20% of the population of the kingdom were Sotapanas. Pretty amazing. And it's, you know, it makes sense. You've got a thousand Arahants walking in. That was the beginning. They all had their disciples. Sariputra and Mahamogalana came in, and then they, you know, then the efforts at generating the, the sasana and getting people established and passing fruits, that's when things really took off. Those two were like, they called the Marshal of the Dharma. They were, uh, you know, it was quite a movement. And so it made sense, really. 20% were at least Sotapanas, and uh, we must have had a lot of our hands. Even at this hotel where we're having this talk, I'm pretty sure would have been part of the Vela Vela. It would have been a huge uh, bamboo grove. It's just 500 meters that way. So we go out that way and then we come back. It's actually just over there. So uh, we're in a holy land. So we're talking about Ajahn Man often talks about noble wealth, he talks about worldly wealth. The Thai people these days are quite committed to worldly success, more materialistic than a few decades ago. And he's often telling them, you know, the real wealth that you want to be interested in is the Aryasa, which is noble wealth, which is an internal wealth. And he says, that's the most precious thing, and you need to cultivate it by being generous, by keeping the precepts, by meditating. So, in terms of a civilization, this was an epicenter for inner wealth. We come now, we can't see, we can see a few rocks, which was the, was the fort of Magadha, we can see those rocks. We can see some terracotta bricks where monasteries were, but there's no, in terms of a, incredible ruins, there's not much to look at, is there? And many of the people that really benefited have already gone to Nibbana. But what happened there, and this we need to recollect, is that this noble lineage of teachers teaching disciples and disciples teaching their disciples went to Malaysia, Australia, Ireland. <laughs> I don't think so. Well, there are. Well, what is it? Is there, isn't it? Buddhism. The, the Buddha's teachings are in every book store. And it's like, but basically, this, originally it was an oral tradition. People memorized texts and people taught from their experience. Later on it became written down. But basically it started here. And so uh, we were making a pilgrimage to the heartland where, where it all began. And, uh, who felt peaceful meditating in the Vilavana? Yeah, that's what he's nodding. Who felt peaceful meditating on Bolsha's Peak? So, if you look at those people who are trying to sell you flowers, and you look at those people who are putting the, the money on the shrine, trying to fool you to think that you should keep money, so that when you walk away they put it in their pockets, the peaceful feeling is not coming from them. And it's not coming from the guy with the sari. <laughs> so, where is it coming from? What occurred then, you imagine thousands of Anahan. I said this before, when you walk into what Nongkapong, where Ajahn Ta, one bhikkhu, is believed to become an Anahan, you can feel something. Something, an energy is in that forest. It's not just because Ajahn Ta became an Anahan there, it's also because there's a large community of monks who keep precepts and meditate every day. So there's several things happening. But certainly in places where people do get liberated, where their minds are purified, and, and energy seems to stick to that place. You could probably feel the same thing in Ajahn Mahabula's monastery, and uh, Ajahn Anand's monastery. And here, even with the relative coarseness of downtown Rajki, which is just over that wall at the Venavana, all those uh, beggars and uh, all those trucks and buses and all the dust. 
Tonight I got back, the first thing I did was wash every piece of clothing as well as and, and myself in the bathtub. I just like we were out in the rich, holy dust of Rosky for about seven hours today. And the colour of the water is black, you know. I've never had black washing water quite as black as in Bihar. <laughs> anyway. But what is it that when you're meditating, you know, despite the filth, despite the noise, despite the coarseness, there's something here, isn't there? You all felt some, uh, some special energy. So it's a special place. We don't need to go to a museum. We don't need to look at statues. We don't need to look at scriptures. We just kind of meditate and we feel this place was about meditation. This place was about purifying the mind. And thousands of people, tens of thousands of people did. Which is, it's really wonderful that you can come here and feel that. I myself have been here several times, so none of this is new. But I always feel, and when we went up to Vulture's Peak this morning and I did my first bow, I wept. Just when my head touched that ground, just with a sense of, there's a sense of coming home. There's, there's, there's nowhere quite as spiritually charged, I don't think, as uh, Vulture's Peak and Bogart. Mm -hmm. For myself, that's how it feels to me. So when I put my head on that, that concrete, there's a feeling of oh, something here I really love, really cherish really aspire to realize and it's like you get so close you can smell it or you can taste it or something <laughs> and we meditate it and we, and we meditate it and we taste it with our mind or we smell it with our mind and we feel a little closer but what this does to your faith faculty is really helpful for you in the future and I think just that when you leave here you're just going to feel a deeper connection with the enlightenment tradition and so, so it's a really good thing to do and that we've gone to Velavana a couple of times and then you meditate in Sarah Prophet and Madalana's caves and then offer flowers and go to Vulture's Peak a few times. So when you go home, you can recollect these places. You'll have a feeling of connectedness. And many people ex experience this, that when they go home, just recollecting meditating on the holy sites brightens their minds. And this is a really beautiful gift that you've given yourselves because we all come up with challenges, we all come up with struggles. And so it'll get, sometimes it gets a bit dry and it's just, you just weigh down by the stuff of life. And then we train ourselves in recollecting the good things that we did that was inspiring and it lifts our energy up again. You don't have to be here to recollect how inspired you were. And you don't have to be here to, to just remind yourself that uh, spiritual pursuit has its rewards, that the paths and the fruits of spiritual practice are real millions of beings have realized them. Talk about this and just talk a little bit about this, the phenomenon in Volta's Peak. How many other people feel when you're up there that it's aloof from the world? Does anyone else feel that? Yeah. yeah. Basically everyone. Does anyone else feel that it's close to heaven? Because I do. And so it's, it's, like, it's actually just a few hundred meters high. But when you get halfway up that, that staircase, Mm. something happens energetically for me you just feel elevated and then it feels aloof and then when you're on that actual peak you feel close to heaven so for me it's like I have no doubt that the Buddha taught thousands of devas there <laughs> it's a perfect plane and it's a wonderful space element you know you could, you could imagine 10,000 devas listening to a Dharma talk there really nice it's always a haze there sorry there haze? Is that almost there? I don't think so. I think in the time the Buddha was there, it was mostly forest. And I think the, the haze is that people cook with cow excrement. Mm. Yeah. And this so dust. everybody's cooking with cow excrement. There's a particularly acrid smoke. Oh, and then there's the, the road yeah. traffic as well, stirring up the dust. <laughs> and, a, and a bit of mist, probably. But it's really, in the morning. Because yeah. yeah. you get the impression that it's a separation from the earth. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Down below, the, the, thicker the, about the, the haze and the yeah. sky, yeah. that uh, section, yeah, it separates it, from the lower section. And you're above the, the haze. Section, above it, Being right. above the haze, it's not, isn't it? Anyway, I love it. I love Vulture's Peak. What well, I'm going to tell you now, it's not related to Vulture's Peak, but it's, it's kind of related to Vulture's Peak. This is private information. Arjun Anand said that at Sarnath, which is where we're going in a few days, in about a week, when the Buddha taught the first sermon, Anya Kondanya was the first human Sotapanna. I asked Ajahn Alam, were Devas listening? He said, yes, many. And he said, 
I asked them, did any of them become enlightened? He said, yes. I asked him how many. He said, how many do you think he said? He said, millions. Now, I don't think he would make that up. It's not emphasized in the sutras that you can become enlightened as a deva. And it makes sense. If you, you do your dharma and you keep your precepts and you meditate a lot and you have a disposition where you love the dharma and you listen to a lot of dharma and the merit of that got you reborn in heaven, of course you're going to have an inclination to. It's also in the suttas that when the bodhisattva left to see to heaven, the devas of the dharma tinsa were dancing joyfully and brandishing banners and, and celebrating because they knew Tushita is above Dalatimsa, they would have seen him come down. And they knew the Bodhisattva has been reborn, he's going to be the Buddha. Indra came and asked them, what are you all singing and dancing for? The heaven of the 33, the, the other ministers. And they said, the Bodhisattva has been born, he's going to be a Buddha. We're rejoicing because there's going to be an age of, of great light. So the devas, those that rejoice in goodness, know about the Bodhisattva and they know that he's been reborn and they know that he's going to be enlightened because they have a divine eye some capacity to be aware of what will happen in the future as well so why wouldn't and, and then when the Buddha got enlightened there was this light that spread through the heavens and the hills and lit up the whole of conditioned reality and if you were a deva and you loved goodness you would notice that and you would look down and say oh the Buddha is enlightened now and you would see that Brahma Sahampati came down to talk to the Buddha you would notice that Brahma Sahampati being like the next radiant thing after the Buddha in the universe <laughs> and, what, and you would probably listen to the conversation be a very interesting conversation wouldn't it conversation between the Brahma and the Buddha and uh, so the Buddha is explained he's enlightened but he's not going to teach it it's too subtle and then the Brahma Sahampati says some people will understand, please teach. He reviews the world, he says, they will understand. Okay, I will teach. So if you're a deva, and if you've been a Buddhist in your past life, and you know there's a Buddha, and you know he's agreed to teach, and you know he's formulating the way he's going to teach, you would be following him, I would think. And so it makes sense to me that Anya Kondanya had made a specific vow, he wanted to be the first person in the human world, to be enlightened, so he became a Sotapanna. Apparently, in that first sermon, millions of devas also attained to Dhamma. Whether you believe that or not, it doesn't matter, but I do, and it's encouraging, because, and it makes sense. If you think of the time that the Bodhisattva spent cultivating the Bhagavad millions of lives, there has to be a similarly grand result. You know, all those beings that build auspicious karma with him, millions of lifetimes, cultivating virtue, many of them would, have to, would be in heaven as a result of that virtue. And many of them would be right to listen to teachings. And so, why not? And I ask that gentleman, because it's often said, it's, never, it's not written in the suttas, but it's often said by monks, uh, they just can't realize Dhamma. It's best to, be a, it's best to practice as a human. Now, it is a best to practice as a human, if you are a human. It's a, good, it's a good situation between heaven and hell. You can contemplate pleasure, you can contemplate pain, you can contemplate aging, you can contemplate you know, the generation of the body. It's an excellent situation for contemplating impermanence and uh, that flux of feeling. So it's a very good situation. And it is good that people don't... And I think one of the reasons realizing Dhamma as a Deva isn't emphasized is because the Buddha doesn't want us to be heedless. If you're a human being and you've met the teachings now, practicing now is what's going to make you right to realize Dhamma as a Deva, if you do get reborn as a Deva. But you have to have that inclination. Because this, the subtlety and the pleasure of the heaven realm is, is better than it is here. And we all know that we can get deluded by pleasure, distracted by it. So if you don't have this love of Dharma and this love of practice and this aspiration to realize something better, you can get very distracted by sensual pleasure. So it's not encouraged to aspire to be, be, to be reborn as a deva and to try to realize Dharma as a deva, but I think it's the result. If you're very, very sincere in your human practice, you get born as a deva, but you have this tendency to... You know, the whole point of what I'm saying is, is 
I also believe that millions of Danes were enlightened and felt just people. Mm. I think so. I don't have as an immense perspective. <laughs> but I think so. And I think that's part of what we can feel up there. This beautiful uh, energy mm. is just there all the time. And uh, whether you believe that the begin that the Vajrayana began there, that's a personal choice. The the Lotus Peak is celebrated by all of the Buddhist traditions. In the Chan, the Shurangama Mantra, the Chan tradition is huge. That was said to have been taught there on Lotus Peak. And the Prajnaparamita, which is a huge... I think Tibetan monks in the Galupa tradition anyway, I think they spend four years studying Prajnaparamita Sutta. It's years, which Manjushri and Maitreya came in visions of monks at Nalanda which is where we're going tomorrow, by the way, yes. and reported, this is what the Buddha taught on Lotus Peak to us. So, if you understand that Manjushri and Maitya are tenth level Bodhisattva, so this is what our Buddha was when he was a prince, he's tenth level Bodhisattva. The Bodhisattva Buddhas have ten levels, That's what, and it takes millions of lives to, to get there. And so you understand that, it makes sense to me as well, like, personally I don't doubt it, and I don't try to force others to believe it, but I don't, I don't doubt it, even though my teachers are arahants and I have enormous respect for the Theravada tradition, I don't doubt that highest level bodhisattvas would come to receive teachings from the Buddha. Of course they would. That's what they're aspiring to be. And I don't doubt that the Buddha wouldn't be able to explain the most subtle explanations of emptiness and wisdom. What else would they talk about? They'd be, you know, <laughs> what would the Buddha talk to high level bodhisattvas about, other than the highest wisdoms? So, Anyway, for me, I just rejoice about in the activities of Buddhas, and the activities of Bodhisattvas, and the activities of Arahants. And uh, just since we mentioned Malanda, we're going there tomorrow. The Theravadans is the hometown of Sariputta, uh, and his relics, I think, are still in the stupa. The big stupa, behind us in that picture, Sariputta stupa. And uh, it's also the place where Sariputta attained final Nibbana, and it's a great story. His mum, his mum was a Brahmin, she didn't have any faith in the Buddha at all, even though her son is like the foremost disciple with as much wisdom as the Buddha. She had no faith. But she's a faith type, but she wasn't impressed by wisdom. So the son realized I've helped millions of beings attain to our hardship, but my mum still has no faith. Anyway, so so I could have realized this is one thing I haven't yet accomplished. Of all the things I've accomplished, I haven't yet helped my mum. So he decided to go and die in her home. And what happened is Indra came to pay respects to Sariputta because he saw that he was going to pass into final Nibbana and then so did a Brahma day, you know, Brahma. And the mum obviously had enough sensitivity to see, oh, who was that? Well, that was Indra. Oh, well, who was that? That's your Brahma. That's your beloved Brahma. <laughs> so, but he came to pay respects to you. That's right, mother. <laughs> and the mother became a, a Buddhist before he died. So. <laughs> anyway, that happened in Nalanda. I mentioned that because we're going to Nalanda. I do a little bit more reading. This is about the two chief disciples. Since we were meditating in a cave where Muhammad Kalana spent Kamsa, and a cave where Sariputta attained enlightenment. Back to the Sarabhans, back to the Theravada. The occasion was this, the wanderer Sanjaya was living at Rajagaha with a large following of wanderers, with 250 wanderers, and Sariputta and Mogalana were living the holy life under the wanderer Sanjaya. They had made a pact that whichever of them first reached the deathless should inform the other. Now it being morning, the venerable Asaji dressed and taking his bowl and outer robe, he went into Rajagaha for arms. His manner as he went inspired confidence, whether in moving forwards or backwards, looking ahead or aside, bending or stretching, his eyes were downcast and he moved with grace. The wanderer Sariputta saw him thus as he was begging for arms in Rajagaha, and he thought, There are Arahants in this world, those who possess the Arahant path, and this bhikkhu is one of them. Suppose I approach him and ask under whom he has gone forth, or who is his teacher, or whose dharma he confesses. But then he thought, It is not the time to ask this bhikkhu while he is wandering for arms among houses. Suppose I follow behind him to trace what the seekers have discovered. 
When the venerable Asaji had finished his round, he left Rajagaha with his alms food. Then the wanderer Sariputta went up to him and greeted him. When this courteous formal talk was finished, he stood at one side and he said to him, Friend, your faculties are serene. The color of your skin is clear and bright. Under whom have you gone forth? Who is your teacher? Or whose dharma do you confess? There is a great monk friend, the son of the Sakyams, who went forth from the Sakyam clan. I have gone forth under that blessed one. He is my teacher. It is that blessed one's dharma that I confess. But what does the Venerable One's teacher say? What does he tell? I have only recently gone forth, friend. I have only just come to this Dharma and discipline. I cannot teach you the Dharma in detail. Still, I will tell you its meaning in brief. Then Sariputta said, So be it, friend. Say much or little as it suits you. Tell me but the meaning now, for I need no more than the meaning, with no thought of details yet. The Venerable Asaji told the wanderer Sariputta this sketch of the Dhamma, the perfect one has told the cause of causally arisen things and what brings their cessation to. Such is the doctrine preached by the great monk. Now when the wanderer Sariputta heard this statement of the Dhamma, the spotless, immaculate vision of the Dhamma arose in him. All that is subject to arising is subject to cessation. This is the truth. Even if that were all, you have attained the state where is no sorrow that we for many times, ten thousand ages, have let pass by unseen. Sariputta the wanderer went to Moggallana. So, you get that, it's very brief, but it's very important. Paticca Samapada, we were content, we were chanting it, we've been chanting it, this is what the Buddha contemplated, we had another reading where he was contemplating under the Bodhi tree, the causes of conditioned experience and undoing the causes leading to liberation. In brief, the Buddha talks of causally arisen things and what brings their cessation. That's all Sariputta needed to hear. Things which have causes to arise have causes to cease, and he became Sotapanna. Sariputta the wanderer went to Moggallana. The wanderer Moggallana, the wanderer saw him coming. He said, your faculties are serene, friend. The color of your skin is clear and bright. Is it possible that you have found the deathless? Yes, friend, I have found the deathless. But how did you find it, friend? So I put it, the wanderer told what had happened. When Moggallana, the wanderer, heard the statement of the Dhamma, the perfect one has told the cause of cause of the arisen things and what brings their cessation to, such is the doctrine preached by the great monk. Then the spotless, immaculate vision of the Dhamma arose in him, all that is subject to arising is subject to cessation. So they had a pact that whoever should find the deathless would come back and teach the other. So now, the same four-line verse and Mahamogalana is also Sotapanna. It's interesting that Asaji said, I am new to this Dhamma and discipline, I cannot teach you the Dhamma in detail. He was an Arahant. He was one of the first five disciples that the Buddha had taught the Anatalaka <coughs> to. But he was uh, very modest, evidently. Another reason to read this is because the Blessed One was in the Velavana when Mahamogalana and Sariputta went to meet him there. So this is the story. Mogalana said, Friend, let us go to the Blessed One. The Blessed One is our teacher. But friend, these 250 wanderers are living here depending on us, looking to us. They ought to be consulted first. They will do as they think fit. So they've been living with Sanjaya and his 250 followers. They went together to the wanderers and told them, Friends, we are going to the Blessed One. The Blessed One is our teacher. We live depending on the Venerable Ones, looking to them. If they go to lead the holy life under the great monk, then we too will do the same. So Sariputta and Moggallana went to Sanjaya, the wanderer, and told him what they were going to do. Enough, friends, do not go. Let us three guide this community together. For the second and for the third time, they told him the same thing and received the same answer. Then Sariputta and Moggallana went with the 250 wanderers to the bamboo grove and hot blood gushed from Sanjaya the wanderer's mouth. The Blessed One saw Sariputta and Moggallana coming in the distance and when he saw them he told the bhikkhus, Here come these two friends Kalita and Upatissa. These two will be my chief disciples, an auspicious pair. Then it was that the Master announced them. They who were already liberated in the domain of profound knowledge, in the supreme destruction of the stuff of existence, before they had reached the bamboo grove, 
saying, here come these two friends, Kulita and Upatissa, these two will be my chief disciples and auspicious pair. So Kuta and Moggallana went up to the Blessed One and prostrated themselves at his feet. They said to him, Lord, we wish to have to go forth under the Blessed One and the admission. Come because, the Blessed One said, the Dhamma is well proclaimed, lead the holy life for the complete ending of suffering. And that was those Venerable One's admission. Now at that time a number of well-known Magadan clansmen were leading the holy life under the Blessed One and people disapproved. They murmured and protested, the monk Gautama is creating childlessness and widowhood. He is obliterating the clans. So many people are inspired and going forth. Already a thousand matted hair ascetics have gone forth under him. When they saw bhikkhus, they mocked them with these stanzas. Gautama the monk did come to the fort of Magadha. He led away all of Sanjaya's band. Whom will he lead away today? The bhikkhus heard this and they went to the Blessed One and told him, he said, this affair will not last long. It will only last seven days and at the end of the seven days it will subside. So when people mock you with this stanza, you can reprove them in return with this one. They lead by Dhamma, who are great heroes too, and perfect ones. And when they thus lead by Dhamma, where is the ground for jealousy? So when people mock them, they reproved the people in return. Then people began to think, monks who are sons of the Sakyans lead by Dhamma, it seems, not against Dhamma and the affair lasted seven days, and after the seven days it subsided. The elder Mogalara attained Arahantship seven days after going to the Buddha. The elder Sariputta passed a fortnight in reviewing and analyzing with insight all levels of consciousness. Then Maha Mogalara, within seven days, finished his work, and not only finished his work, came out of finishing his work with the same amount of psychic power as the Buddha, equal to the Buddha in psychic power. So that meant there's occasions where the Buddha and Mahamogalana become aware of a conceited thought from a Brahma Deva and they both fly to the Brahma runs together to teach him. So that kind of mind reading capacity, pretty amazing. And uh, Sariputta took two weeks. The reason why Sariputta took longer is he's the foremost in wisdom. He had to understand every knowable Dhamma, which took two weeks. After having trained for one Asankhaya and a hundred thousand eons. So reviewing it all so that by when he got in line, he understood every Dhamma. That took him two weeks. And his final, final arahantship was realized while listening to a sermon taught by the Buddha to someone else in that case. So you can imagine where we were meditating, Lord Buddha, it's not enough for him to stand, but you could see that monks could see it. And the Buddha's sitting, teaching another person, so the Buddha was fanning him, keeping the mosquitoes away, and as he listened, he got the final attainment. So isn't it nice to have been able to offer flowers and meditate in the cave? So the Buddha became an Arahant and meditate on the mountain top where the Buddha taught the devas and walk down possibly the same path where these great beings went for arms, food and to now to sleep in the place where the bamboo grows with the thousand Arahants were. Not going to have many days like this just like that. <laughs> happy for you all. I rejoice in your good karma and your increasing good karma. May it lead us all to great insight and liberation. Thank you. Thank you.